episode of Gypsy Jazz Replay with Chris and Brad. I'm Brad. I'm Chris. And today we have our special guest. Adrian Holabadi. And what we just played for you is a great tune called uh, Double Scotch, but it's also called Double Whiskey. No? Okay. And uh, Adrian wanted to play this because he had a whole bag full of cool tricks and cool licks. So we're going to break down, as always, uh, what we did and uh, kind of our ideas and our approach to play the song. So let's go ahead and start breaking things down. So what the heck was that that you were doing on the head? Uh, I like to put in, because it's kind of a wacky song, I like to put in little musical <laughs> musical <laughs> funniness. So I think I did two things there. Uh, on the C major, I did a quick, Oof. which is a D major triad and a really high. Uh, and the key is not just the harmonic interesting stuff, but the like the mm -hmm. jab. like. Yeah. I'm walking down the street, I'll punch you in the face, and I'll keep walking, you know, it's yeah, kind of that yeah, yeah. humor. And, and, then, and you're not necessarily thinking of a crazy harmony, you're just thinking, ah, this is how it sounds really out there, and boom. It's more the rhythmic, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it is kind of, it is a cool, uh, over C, you do this, it's a kind yeah. of a cool sound, but more the priority is the rhythm. Okay. It's, it's ear catching. Yeah. People think, oh, I know this song. It what? wakes up <laughs> people in the audience, man, like they're nodding up, oh, they're playing double scotch. Oh, yeah. 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 Doesn't that happen a lot to you? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not anymore. Yeah, not anymore, yeah. man. <laughs> he solved it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> By throwing all these little in all the songs, dude. Yeah. And but, then the, the other one was uh, a uh, just arpeggio in C sharp. I like on this one because it goes C then C sharp. Uh, in the rhythm, yeah. I like to emphasize that the chord changed as opposed to just staying on C. Sounded familiar to me, so I bet it's a quote. It was a quote, it comes from Nuage. Uh, ending of course, the, the ending of Nuage. Yeah. I think maybe you did it a couple of times, a couple of recordings, yeah. So, what's up? Did you plan to play a quote or just, do they just come out? Because I know that you know lots of quotes. They just come out. I wish I planned better, it would sound better if it was <laughs> you planned. Wish, you wish you can control it, but it just it comes out just of you. Like, I'm playing and then someone, play a quote! Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I was wondering, because what is that thing, because I know you love quotes, you even teach a workshop during Jung and June with like the best quotes. Yeah. So you have a, you must have a large collection of them, so like do you search for them or? Uh, no, they just come out, you know. Uh, they just come to me. <laughs> they just come to me from listening to a lot of music and uh, yeah, I don't practice them. Okay. They just come down. It's just something like when you hear music over and over again, it subconsciously gets into your uh, exactly. brain or something. Okay, so I, I thought maybe you worked them out, like, okay, I can use them in this song, or this book, no. No, some, uh, like, long ones that go over entire chord progressions, yeah, I would okay. work it out. Yeah. Um, but for shorter ones, you're saying it's more of, like, an inception approach. Inception. Where they get inside of you and they control you. Right. Yeah, for something that's only, like, a couple beats or a couple, uh, one bar. I think that's all another ear catching like trick or yeah absolutely I, yeah nice one thing i do a lot i realize as i look at this video is end a phrase in the middle of the bar like either just after the one or the end of one and i like that and then often like i get caught up in it and i have to, like like jump up as i hit that last uh -huh. note sort of emphasize that i'm not going to play anymore for the rest of the bar yeah and I like that because it keeps people on their toes and it's it's rhythmically interesting. It's not just da 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 You even do it in the solo break. I like it I like it particularly in the solo break because normally people would fill up all the space in the solo break. And then this trend came of playing nothing in the solo break. Yeah. So this would be like a happy medium. Yeah. 
<laughs> and it's nice because there's like a, it creates a lot of tension and then when you fix it, it's very relaxing, you know. It's tough to pull off because you need to play with people who have good senses of time. <laughs> Throw them so, off. Uh, yeah, yeah if, if you just do nothing for the break and everyone comes in at a different time, it just turns into a fiasco. And do you have a thought of what note should be that you end on? Because I know it's like for the solo break, it was a flat nine. It's not like a regular note. Yeah, I like to end on the funny ones. Uh, I try to be deliberate on that. I try to be either do a funny one or do a really straight one and, and know, know how each of those sounds in my head before I do it to get the mood that I want to get. Yeah, that's great. huge uh, gap of silence. So sometimes you have to think as a rhythm player, how do we go back in? How do we get the swing going back in? And I think you filled up this, you filled up part of this gap. Yeah, you do too. And it's not only in breaks, it's also like uh, before a new section, for a new beat, mm -hmm. you just do this like cool rhythm management. Mm -hmm. And when I didn't play guitar, when I was just a violin player, I always thought that was the coolest thing. Uh -huh. And then actually when I started playing guitar, it was more difficult than I thought. Mm -hmm. uh, because if you do it wrong, you mess up the complete flow of the song. Yeah. So then I started watching other people and I noticed that most people do it uh, with a up stroke and then down stroke. Mm -hmm. So then it would sound yeah. like, like this. <laughs> but Nusha does it the other way around. He does a down stroke and an up stroke and it sounds more powerful even, like this. Yeah. And I, I, I always do it this way. Mm -hmm. And then you can really put some oomph in the, in the, in the offbeat note. Yeah. So that's the way I do it. Yeah, and also, if you do it with a lot of authority and it's a little bit uh, offbeat, then people will adjust. <laughs> so I, it's like it's more logical and straightforward. But since I haven't been doing it that way for so long, uh, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. is. It is kind of weird because you have to do two down strokes in a row mm -hmm. uh, in eighth notes, which you would never do in in rhythm. No, rhythm no playing. So yeah, you have to practice it. Okay. But nice trick anyway. Yeah. So I'm curious. Would you guys have done that if I hadn't left silence in the break? Maybe you would have still done it, but it would have been a little bit more quiet. Actually, yeah, that's a good question because that's the way it should be, right? We should yeah. be reacting to, <laughs> to whatever the solo is doing. But I actually, I'm thinking I'm going to do it for way before. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 like, I already thought about it this morning when I woke up and I was going to fill that gap. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you're right. It should be like a conversation thing. So maybe if you put a silence there, I shouldn't do it because it breaks kind of the, the tension of the silence. That's true. But sometimes it's also a good solution if you're not completely sure if everybody's still at the yeah. same. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Man. So later in your solo, you uh, you do this little cool unison uh, lick. Uh, it's kind of like a pedal point, like almost like a classical thing. What's what's going on there? It's just uh, picking, doing a unison node uh, on two different strings and then changing one of them but leaving the other one the same. Okay. Oh yeah, and then you, yeah, you switch from the first finger to the fourth finger so you can do it below the notes too. Yeah, I don't know if I did that at this time, but you can, yeah. Yeah, yeah. What I, what I like about it is, uh, I mean, playing chromatic phrases is... is it's a thing, right? You can do it. Yeah. But it's, the danger is that it sounds like a chromatic scale. Mm -hmm. So if you do stuff like this, maybe you play different rhythms, or you have a pedal note that's also ringing. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, it's uh, it's not so chromatically playing playing chromatic scale, but it's, it's interesting. Yeah. It's not so direct. Yeah. You know? yeah. You know another reason to use the pedal tone? No. Uh oh. We're in Holland. And everyone's on the bike. That's <laughs> <laughs> That's why I waited a little bit to so cut it off. No, that should be it. That should be it. <laughs>
thing I really noticed in your solo, the whole solo, is that you use a lot of motifs, like little phrases that you uh, change a little bit, but there's like a general line, and it's a very uh, melodic way of improvising, getting away from like stock licks, but using your own creativity to build a whole solo. So what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, that that's one of my very favorite things about Django, is that you can hear his solo, and it's uh, it's so melodic that you can turn off the recording and hum it because it's yeah. so distinctive. And it, it's also, uh, I think, easier to do that than to make some some lick, mm -hmm. play some lick because it doesn't have to be as fast. I can't play fast at all. So I, I rely on my crutch, which is making hopefully interesting melody. You, you rely and, on your crutch of being musical. <laughs> <laughs> what a crutch. <laughs> so, but, so if the tempo is really fast, what do you do then? Uh, like it's a really I, nice I put my guitar down and go to the bathroom. <laughs> he puts his guitar down and he scats. I, like I, <laughs> no, because if you play fast, then but the motifs have, have, have to be fast as well. Yeah, well, or I can just make them like half notes and yeah. seven oh, eight okay, notes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you can play around. Fine. But yeah. for me, the more uh, I find that approach more difficult because um, you have to find a good motif to start with. You know, that's that's a good point, but also I might push back a little bit uh, and say. It doesn't necessarily have to be good, it just has to be consistent. Like, I'll just make something up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> something up, please. Yeah. Make something up C, okay. Chord changes to F. Okay, yeah. You know, you just, the chord changes and then you just do that same rhythm yeah. and it almost doesn't even matter what notes you do as long as it's. Yeah. It, it's almost it's almost like the motif itself isn't interesting. It's the fact that something's being repeated that's interesting and cool. Also, exactly. Also, like if you repeat the joke, uh, then often enough becomes funny. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I th also think that if you make something musical, like like a call and response, I think a lot about call and response. Like, if I started out with this. You want to hear, da, da, yeah, da, you know, yeah, like, yeah, sure. if you don't do that, you're denying the audience that. Shutting you down. Like, yeah. And maybe you want to deny people, it's a calculated thing, that's part of it. If you feel like a sick freak or something. If you're a sick freak, <laughs> you, know, you can deny that, it's all about so you never, tension. So you never practice motifs at home? Like, no, I consider that, pra practice for that is just listening to a lot of music. Yeah, I think the value in what Adrian is trying to do is that there is nothing prepared. Yeah. It's just something that you figure out on the spot and then you try to match, you know, an idea or something. Oh, so you, you never actually practice any licks? I was just wondering about that. No, I practice getting a good sound and just dexterity, but licks, no, rarely. You know, I so I'm from Chicago and there's a big improv comedy thing there. That's where, like, improv comedy. My wife and I would always go to the same show every Saturday night called World News Tonight. And it's the same improvisers, and the beautiful thing about it is every week you go, it's completely different. It's completely made up. And if they were to do the same thing two weeks in a row, it would just kind of be, it would lose its magic. Like if they were to use the same pieces but use them in a different order, it would still lose its magic. Yeah, and pieces or demeanors or jokes. You know, part of the incredible thing about watching improv comedy is you know that they're making it up on the spot. And that's what really makes it funny and special. So when I play improvised mu music, I try to reach that. I don't reach it, but I attempt to get to that same thing. So that's thing. the inspiration maybe for this approach. Definitely, yeah. Okay, interesting. No, but the, fun the, the funny thing is, or the, the interesting thing is that there are many approaches to uh, yeah. learning how to improvise, and they all, they all can work. Right? They can all fail also, of course. Mm -hmm. But they can work, and uh, they can work together. And Definitely, it, yeah. In the end, it's about what actually sounds, and if the sound is good, then it, uh, then it doesn't really matter if you use licks or motifs mm -hmm. or some other approach skills. You can say, I'm a skill, a skill improviser. If you can make it work, that's fine. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>
Adrian, do you when there's a song with one chord like this, this this song essentially has one chord for the A part. You know, it has that little D flat every now and then, but you're mostly playing just over one chord. Do you approach that in any special way or think, okay, how do I do this? Because there's not a lot of harmonic information to go off of, you know? Yeah. This is like uh, you're in a desert and you're desperate to drink something and you find a little drip of water on a some, <laughs> uh, somewhere and you're like, uh, on a water faucet. <laughs> on a water faucet. <laughs> we, we get some <laughs> improv comedy for it. <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. <laughs> yeah. so, so my philosophy is I search for that one little drop and on this song, it isn't just that C, it does go up yeah. to the C sharp, D yeah. flat, whatever. Yeah. So whenever... That happens, I try to like double down on that double and, down. and highlight it yeah, okay. instead of this. So I think maybe every single time on the every single chorus that I did, whenever that changed, I got one of the notes of of that instead of C to try okay. to hammer it home. But I have enough. Yeah. No, that's it. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Another thought here is uh, you can give people what they want. Or you can deny that. Oh man. So when the chord changes, it starts C and then it goes up there. You want to hear a note that fits that, that chord change. So you can either do and give people what they want, or you can deny them and do something that doesn't fit in it. And that tension is uh, something that I think about a lot. Yeah, but I um, one of the things I do not not in this song particularly, but if the, if the chord go up, then I I try to make the the line go down. Ah. So instead of doing a, a root, uh, right? Yeah. So then the movement of the solo is the other it's direction. Like contrary. Yeah, especially when the chords are parallel. This is not really parallel. But let's say it goes from D minor to E flat minor, then I try to repeat. If I use a motif, I try to repeat the line in a lower note, of course I have to change some notes around, I can keep the same rhythm, so that it doesn't seem like I'm even following that parallel chord change. Yeah. Or also another approach is that you can just throw your own chord change on it because nothing's happening. <laughs> so sometimes, yeah. I mean, if it's a C, then you could just, you could start playing C diminished. Or you can right, start yeah. playing C and you can throw in a G7, even though there's no G7 there. Or you can throw in a D flat 9. If there's no default. And then the problem becomes can you think of this while you play? <laughs> because now you're saying like C diminished, I think that's a good trick. And I know that's a good trick, yeah. but I didn't think of it yeah. while we're playing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I do it all <laughs> There's another analogy which is uh, you, you play something, you play, and then the chord changes, and you still do that. Something I think about is if you're walking down the street and it's a beautiful day and you just Say to Brad, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? And you keep walking. If you had that same exact trans transaction, same conversation, but it was pouring rain, I just, it's a beautiful day, isn't it? I did the same exact thing, but the meaning was changed because of the context. Yeah, yeah. That's something I think about a lot. So the note, it's not just the note, it's the context of the note. So on this song, it's you play over the C, and then it changes that C sharp, you play the same thing. But it's not really it's outside, like, right? It's really outside. Yeah, yeah. But because the chord changes back, you can do it. So so space. wait a second. So you can play outside by playing inside. <laughs> that's actually really good advice, though, and that's a very interesting way of looking at it, actually. Yeah, if you know the chord uh, resolves back to C, why not? Right. But that's the thing. You can all, you can just play C if you want, and just let the rhythm guitar play D flat, and and create some tension by just playing C. Yeah. It's automatic tension. And, and it's interesting how you think of oh, if we have to play outside, so say there's a C major, and we can play outside, we can do some crazy uh, B major thing or or D flat thing. Or if you just uh, you know if the chords are changing and you ignore the chord changes, then you're playing outside too. That's true. That's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I started my solo and I was uh, highlighting the major seven of the chord and this gets back into how we're talking about what do we do when there's just one chord sitting there. So sometimes I like to approach it by looking at chord tones and, I, and, and colors and I think, okay, well I have this huge part of uh, huge eight bars of C 
So if I play uh, some ideas based around the seventh or the sixth or the ninth, and then you get a really nice color for that whole section. So that's one way uh, how I approach a, a long uh, chord change. Is there any reason why you would start your solo like that, or is that doesn't isn't that important? No, it's not important. It's just a, an idea to use. Yeah, it's a okay. simple idea too. Also, it's also simple, so I'm not starting my solo like <laughs> so. I have nowhere to go. Okay. Yeah. Can you show us that? Yeah, it's a. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe Dennis can describe it. Oh yeah. <laughs> So one thing that, that caught my attention was this like cool lick with a minor third, mm -hmm. like a repeating also kind of motive. Yeah. Do you have any Thoughts on that particular motive, or the use, or... Are you trying to say that I'm copying Adrian? Well, <laughs> you were trying to copy Adrian. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah uh, there I, I, I also like doing the same kind of thing, like uh, taking one idea and then changing it a little bit, and then changing the timing of it, you know, maybe keeping the same motif, but then extending it or shortening it so it doesn't fit anywhere. And then also, uh, it was in the kind of uh, it was in the minor, minor pentatonic. Yeah. And I like using that a lot. Django uses it a lot too over major chords. Um, well, not too much though, right? Uh, but what, what's the song where he goes? Uh, uh, Juki Juki. Yeah. So he uses that kind of minor, uh, I don't know, minor pentatonic, but he uses minor ideas over major chords. Yeah. What I, my view on that is that he does use that, but he I think he stays away from. Um, the seven, like the, the B flat, because mm -hmm. then it gets into this pentatonic minor, really like minor pentatonic. Yeah, well, well, he stays more like around the, the, the minor, minor third, third. Like, yeah. like you did actually. No, no, yeah, I know. Yeah, so that's what I'm trying to say is like uh, the minor pentatonic with really hitting the minor third, because yeah. it causes a lot of tension. And, I, and you I, do this for you? Yeah, and the slide. Yeah, we, that's nice, but yeah. oh, I don't think Django would do that. I, I like it though, but yeah. it's not really I don't Django. think Django would do that. I don't think Django would uh, watch Game of Thrones either, but, <laughs> but I love Game of Thrones. So. <laughs> Shredding thing that you're doing. <laughs> yeah, it's something I uh, well actually again I don't I'm not sure if it's a Django lick. I'm just gonna assume it is, but I've heard people play it, and whenever I'm not sure it's a Django lick, it's always a Django lick. So I've heard it on Sweet Georgia Brown a lot because uh, it matches the E7 perfectly, and then when it goes to A7, yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah. those changes in Sweet Georgia Brown they happen in all these rhythm changes uh, songs too, and it's a shreddy it's a shreddy thing, but it's super easy. It's uh, easy and it's, uh, it's very easy to see also, and it uses an open string, which I think is super cool. I'm a huge fan of open strings. Do you hold the alternate pick? pick? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Yeah, alternate Alter pick. So you're not yeah. trying to accent the, the E. Yeah. Ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> <laughs> I know Brett to know many chromatic uh, tricks on the guitar and uh, chromatic lines, and uh, but now you also did it in this solo, but you did it with octaves, and then we can get back to what Brett Agnes was doing with the chromatic lines, using some extra ingredients to spice up chromatics. Yeah, like embellishing it a little. Yeah, bit. and yeah, and then if I do this, I mean, to me, uh, that sounds much better than. It does. Yeah. yeah. It, it, it gives it makes it fuller and it makes it feel like there's more things going on and also you're hitting big intervals you know so it's jumping all over it's more uh, chaotic and then also with in that same phrase I I don't finish it right where you think it would finish I go over the bar right that, that's another thing yeah uh, because the rhythm guitar is already outlining the the the, the parts a especially when you start doing a rhythm rhythm fill before the next part so yeah. For a solo player, it's always a great idea to, to ignore that and just go over the bar line. Yeah. That's one of the... If, you, if people start doing that, you know they are advanced improvisers. Yeah, and like Django yeah. all the time would go over bars. Yeah, yeah he, he would go over the complete <laughs> <different> <laughs> form, right? Yeah. 
He There's was, a complete bar disrespecter. He, you oh, yeah. you actually forget that there is a B part that Django's improvising. It's just a complete story. <laughs> that, that's the thing. Yeah. And you also, heard the joke. Django walked into a bar. It's not a joke because he never walked into the bar. He always skips the bar line. <laughs> oh, nice. Oh, nice. 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 Yeah, so getting back to uh, soloing over a chord progression that basically has one chord, C. Um, we were talking about different approaches, motifs, um, chromatics. Yeah. So what I did purposely, the first A, I just used notes from the C major triad and played, uh, played some licks that used those. Okay, I'm a lick player, you all know that I play licks. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Christian, yeah. I'm a lick player. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then I know some some really cool licks that do make use of the uh, C triad, and um, when I teach uh, at the conservatory students, I call those one three five licks. Mm -hmm. So they they use the the, the root, the, the the third and the fifth, and then you can like embellish every note, or you can play approach notes towards. Uh, and I think I I do both of those things in the first A, and then the second A I start hitting some other. Other chords. Nice to meet you, Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Tritone thing is that, is that what I heard on the page? Yeah, I was watching uh, the Gypsy Jazz replay episode number one. <laughs> ah, you have good taste. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and I saw this cool thing that John was doing with the tritone uh, substitutes. And actually, I, I knew this trick, but I I wasn't using it that much. But then the a bridge of uh, rhythm changes. This is a bridge, rhythm change bridge with like E seven, A seven, the dominant chain again. Then I thought, yeah, let's let's do it. So I started playing. Uh, B flat seven on E seven, and then of course I went to A, and then I played A flat seven on D seven. So I used two tritones and one regular chord, okay. and I I think I ended the bridge, or I'm, I'm pretty sure I ended the bridge with this uh, phrase that I also uh, use in the intro uh, music of uh, <laughs> <laughs> this right. one again. In, in the in the intro music, it's in D. Maybe. Yeah, I uh, and also give a quick thanks to John, John of Isaac for the yeah. the tritone lick, and and to Moses for this, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Moses for this lick. I love that lick. It's uh, the phrase. Uh, it uses part of the altered uh, sound. Um, I recently heard that it's called super low kin. <laughs> it's a cool name, so I would say. Yeah. It's a, it uses the super low kin sound. Yeah. And but the funny thing is, I, I played so that. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> I played that same phrase um, in the Sheik of Arabic video we made. Mm -hmm. But then I used the whole neck because I used to play it. So I played it in C. I cannot even do it with the old finger anymore because, and then I found it in one position, and of course that enables me to play it in many more keys. No, because otherwise yeah. I would run out of neck. But now I can even play it um, in uh, in E flat by doing it here. Right. So, uh, and the, that's a frustrating thing that only happens to me on guitar, not on violin, uh, when you have. A certain fingering, or maybe you see someone else use the finger, and you you practice your ass off on the fingering, and then uh, f 
a month later you find this new thing which is much better and you have to relearn the whole thing. So uh, I don't know if it happened to you, but it happens to me a lot actually. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, while I was setting up uh, all the gear, <laughs> <laughs> all the heavy gear, I heard uh, Adrian teaching you a song, and I think what you played there was directly from that song. Yeah, Adrian was uh, showing me young at heart. You know? Fairy tales can come true. It can happen to you <laughs> yeah. if, if you quote yeah. that song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so he was showing me this tune, and I just wanted to use it immediately before I forgot it. It's such a beautiful tune. And it's one of those things that uh, when you learn something, try to use it as much as possible right away. Otherwise, you're going to forget it in an hour. I mean, you're still going to forget it in an hour. Yeah. But maybe you, an hour and five minutes now. Yeah. So tonight at the gig, you're going to play that lick all the time. Absolutely. <laughs> So we both did this little thing with the C major arpeggio, where we go to the flat five. Yeah, I usually make that face too when I do it too. Hey, it's <laughs> written in the instruction manual. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. I, I did it too. Oh, oh okay. okay. I'm terribly sorry. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. But but it's, it's something in Gypsy Jazz. It's a uh, the flat five or the sharp four, whatever you want to call it. That's such a strong uh, out there sound, you know. So I think it's uh, it's good uh, a good advice to always play around with the five, you know, sharp it and then flat it and then sharp it and then flat it. <laughs> well, what I liked uh, when you did it was that you actually didn't resolve it to the to the five because I did like you does it like yeah. the Simpson Simpson the yeah, 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 exactly. Django lick. I love that. Yeah, yeah it's killer. It's and it's um, a D flat. You were saying that hit the D flat. Yeah, like yeah, exactly. I don't remember what song it is, and I don't think do you no. guys remember. So no. if any of you out there in internet land know, write a comment, and we'll get you free hug. Okay. Free hug. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> free hug. Free kisses from Christian. <laughs> I have this like theory that you, you should not play only single line in your solo. Or well, you could do it in a solo, but like the whole evening, yeah. then it gets really boring, especially on guitars where there's not a lot of uh, space to play long notes, right? Like a violin or, or a clarinet with all the glissandi. They can do a lot, of, a lot of stuff. So we have to use the guitar, and the two ways to get away from single line for me are chords or octaves. So then, then there's a trick with octaves, you listen trick. Um, but it's not so easy to play chords. You could just play the chords. A lot of people just play the chords. But if you can find some like weird voicings, especially a couple of weird voicings in a row that resolve, it's really nice. So I took one from a jazz guitar player, Peter Bernstein. And it's a particularly nice one. It's over a dominant chord uh, going to one, maybe. Let's say it's, it's D to G. Then it's this for D. We solve it to G, right? And I don't think about the theory. It's just I, I remember this uh, specific shapes. Maybe, maybe you could do it with a rhythm, and you can hear it. No, only this lead. So you just play two bars of uh, D7 and uh, two bars of G. One, two, one, two, three. Right. 
And the other one is a one that I learned, I think this week from a Rocky Cassette video. Uh, I think the one that, where he plays on nylon strings, Estate. And that's th these chords. So let's do it to, 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 to G again, because this is to A. Then um, just play the same thing. One, two, one, two, three, four. And the, and the nice thing is you can be completely free with the rhythm, right? You can play them long, you can play some twice. You don't have to end exactly uh, on the G when the G hits. You can, you can delay it or play it earlier. So um, the chord stays the same, but the rhythm and the way I play them, they can change. And, th and they're very powerful because they're on, the, they're on the top four strings. So you can really like hit them and then the top one will like jump out. Terribly sorry, I messed up here. I made a big boo boo. I was building up some tension with some upward moving octaves, but we had more soloing to go. I, I thought we were going into the head, but oh. we went to Brad. So, so, so you just, <laughs> <laughs> a huge disappointment. Yeah, 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 huge disappointment. Because yeah, it, was, it was coming to me and it was getting bigger. I was like, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> also, you meant to play that to, like, to build the climax to go to the ending. Yeah, uh, which is a good thing to do when you're soloing. Also. It's a good thing to do. This was poorly. But played. actually, it didn't bother me, because like, let's say you would, you meant to do it somewhere else. But if you would do that, I would be the next one, and I would try to find something to counter it. Keep you know? the yeah. energy going. Yeah, or, or yeah, or just be very quiet and just find an, uh, like an opposite. Mm -hmm. So it didn't bother me. Yeah, but it's a good thing to think about when you're playing a solo. This is the good takeaway from that is that when you're playing a solo, it's nice to do things that build energy to go somewhere and to think of, uh, you know. Um, What's the word for that? In, uh, arc. Yeah, an arc. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, right after that, I used a, a lick that I really like. It's a bluesy or big bandy lick that's meant to fill up, uh, fill up all the space and push the music forward. And it's actually something from one of our videos that we were playing. Yeah, yeah I think it was my number four lick you should play in jam sessions in general too. Yeah, I think it should be number three. <laughs> <laughs> and it's a good response to the excitement that you built with the mm -hmm. octaves. Yeah. Because exactly. I, I think it's something with, 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 with space. Mm -hmm. But still exciting. Mm -hmm. Because it's like a big band. Yeah, and then after that I used a very nice jangle, like it's one of my favorite jangle that fills with bends. And I think bends are something that we as guitarists should use more. Because it's one of the unique things to a guitar. That you, you know, you can, it's such a nice effect to bend up a string that high and Django would really use that all the time as a really guitar effect. We as gypsy jazz guitar players then, because of course in a, like electric guitar they use it all the time. Yeah, yeah exactly. It's but it's, it's difficult to do on a gypsy guitar because you can only bend up a half step. Huh. So the, the options are limited mm -hmm. and it's easy to do on the B string, but on the lower strings it gets yeah. harder and harder. Yeah. Like if you want to learn the theme of uh, I'll See You In My Dreams, mm -hmm. those bends are pretty hard to yeah. do. Yeah. Right? But it's, it makes it more like if there's a more vocal quality of the That's guitar right. when you're using bends. Yeah, because you can bend it in different speeds or bend it yeah. back slowly or fast. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think we went over all the different aspects of our solos. And uh, I want to thank you, Adrian, for joining us for this episode of Tips Just Replay. Thanks for having me. Thank you. It's fun. Interesting information. I learned a lot. And um, I hope we help you back for another show. For another, maybe one of our other formats, maybe top 10. We can talk about it. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Send the check to Brad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, thank you everyone for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye. <laughs>
right after that I used one of my favorite licks, uh, it's a bluesy lick, and it's actually in another one of our videos. And I think you used it or something. So we're always watching each other's videos, stealing licks from each other. <laughs> well, we're both in the same video. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. It's not a bluesy. It's, it's a bluesy. It's it's bluesy. Are you crazy? Yeah. Super bluesy. Yeah, but there's no there's no blues note in it, right? Or bluesy. Yeah. Uh -huh. It's like big bandy. There's, dude, there's no blues big bandy. That's big yeah. bandy. It's more like a big but bandy. There's, look, there's no blues note here. There's no blues note there, but that's pretty bluesy, man. Yeah. Uh. This should be an outtakes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>